This meeting is being recorded. All right, hello everyone. We are so excited that you are here. We're gonna give it about one minute to make sure that everyone who wants to come online is online and ready to hear about running for row, running for reproductive justice at the state and local level. And we're so excited you're here. So we'll give it about 30 seconds and we'll get started. All right, everybody, good evening and thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to Running for Row, an event hosted by Run for Something. My name is Whitney Murray Brown and I'm the Communications and Special Projects Manager here at Run for Something. So a few housekeeping items before we get started, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat box. Make sure your settings are set to everyone. If you can share your name, where you are and why you're here tonight, that would be incredible. Um, we would also encourage you to feel free to interact using the chat box during the program. Um, interact with other attendees, get to know people in our community. This is really important, especially if you're considering a run for office. Um, so here's how the show will work. Um, after some initial discussion with our panelists, we're going to open the floor up for questions. So please put any questions you have in the panel in the Q&A box. Um, the questions that the panelists will be asked will be pulled from there, not the chat box. It's very important. Make sure you put it in Q&A, not the chat box. Um, for this webinar, we are using Zoom live transcription services. If you would like captions to see them on your screen, click more in the lower right hand corner of your screen and hit and hit show subtitle and then that should pop up the subtitles for you. Um, during this call we are going to launch a poll to make sure that if you need any more information about run for something or running for office you'll be able to opt in so be sure you're paying attention um, to the event so you can opt in and get all signed up. So now a little bit about run for something. A run for something we recruit and support amazing candidates for local office. A lot of people ask why local? Because state and local offices are so critical to the safety and well being of millions of people and have the power to affect issues that matter to constituents the most. And as we've seen over the past month, one of those issues is reproductive rights. The Supreme Court plans to overturn the legal right to abortion in America. And more than ever, we need leaders at the local level to do whatever they can to expand and protect reproductive rights, including the right to abortion. Now, tonight, our guest will discuss why abortion and reproductive rights matter, how their offices will play a crucial role in protecting those rights for all Americans. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you all to someone you are all familiar with, um, our keynote speaker, Cecile Richards. Cecile is a national leader for women's right and social justice and economic justice. She's the president of Planned Parenthood Federation Action Fund for more than a decade. Cecile has worked to increase affordable access to reproductive health care and strengthen the movement for sexual and reproductive rights. So we are so excited you're here. We're so excited to introduce Cecil and go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you, Whitney. Um, and it's great to be with Run For Something again. I really wanna thank um, Ross and Amanda, uh, and Amanda and the whole team for what you do to build progressive power in this country. And there's probably never been a better time uh, to do it. And I was really excited. I just met Becca, uh, who is running for the state house in Texas, making me so proud. So anyway, thank you for that. Um, every cycle, I think, as everyone knows, Run for Something recruits and supports and elects progressive power um, leaders uh, up and down the ballot. And this is such a critical moment in our country to do just that. Um, I was at Planned Parenthood and Planned Parenthood Action Fund for, for about 12 plus years. And in all the time and all the things we did, probably the most important to me was investing in young leaders as activists, um, as organizers, 
um, and eventually as candidates. And so I'm excited that you're going to get to um, be with one of them tonight. My a personal fave, Ana Escamani from uh, Florida. Um, but the work of what Run for Something in general, um, it's one of the reasons, frankly, that the Democratic Congressional Caucus is now the most diverse it's ever been in our history. Um, more people of color, more women, um, more progressives. Um, and that was because Run for Something has helped build the farm team in this country of folks that um, that eventually make it make it to Washington DC. Um, but I think it's also important to know that there's never been a more important time to build state and local power. Because as we're seeing, and of course the topic tonight, Roe, um, it will is, is case in point, so many decisions are now being relegated to the state level, whether it's voting rights or gun reform or criminal justice. Um, and we need a fighting team and, and that's all of you. So an issue that a lot of us have been fighting on for most of our lives, the issue of access to safe and legal abortion clearly is now uh, going back to the states, to state legislatures um, and to governors, which is frankly frightening as hell. Um, but that's why this work is, is so important. Um, although I also wanna say, even though I believe this issue is going back to the states, um, believe you me, the minute the Republican party controls the United States Congress and the presidency, if that happens, passing a national abortion ban will be one of their top priorities. But in the meantime, that's why we've got to do this work at the state level um, to build our leadership at home. Um, we know that if this leaked Supreme Court opinion holds, um, about 26 states in this country will probably ban, if not in total, at least in part, access to safe and legal abortion. That'll mean about half the people of reproductive age in this country will no longer have access in their state um, to abortion. We know in Texas, my home state, um, where abortion has been illegal after uh, six weeks of pregnancy since last September, um, the uh, impact has already been felt. But of course, um, in Texas, if this new Supreme Court opinion uh, holds and Roe is overturned, we'll even have a worse bill in Texas. In fact, all abortion will be illegal in the state. And in fact, doctors uh, will be criminalized um, and stand to be um, put, to, put in jail for as much as a lifetime uh, sentence. State abortion bans that existed before Roe, um, before the Roe decision, but that are still on the book could go into effect. And then of course, in many, many states, state legislatures have passed um, terrible abortion bans, but they've been, they, have been, they have not gone into effect because of the Roe decision. And so those, in fact, of course, um, stand to go into effect as well. States like Arizona, where there's a pre-Roe abortion ban on the books um, could, could outlaw legal abortion. Um, and so I think that's really important. And particularly at this time when, of course, women in particular in this country have been through a lot during COVID, they were just getting over having, um, you know, homeschooled their kids, taking care of aging parents, tried to work in addition to all this uh, and while keeping everyone healthy. And they're now potentially going to wake up into an unimaginable world where decisions about pregnancy have been taken away from them and given uh, to government and to politicians. And this is what the Republican party has been working on for several decades now. So in the next few months, I think as candidates and as organizers and as campaigners, uh, we have to draw this picture for voters. Um, and because I don't think anyone is prepared for what's coming. And so to me, I think there are three things that we need to do. First of all, we need to tell people what just happened. Because when the decision comes out, it's not that suddenly abortion will be illegal. It will start rolling out over the country as state laws go into effect and legal challenges fall away. Um, uh, it'll set off a whole series of, of events um, running all the way, frankly, through the election. Um, so that's case. That's point number one. Number two is we have to explain to people and educate them about how this impacts every American um, in our country. You know, I've spent a lot of time recently talking to docs and clinicians in, in Texas, and they can tell you um, uh, just how bad it is. I was just speaking to a clinician in Lubbock, Texas, who talked about a young student from Texas Tech who came in 
to get a pregnancy test and found out not only was she pregnant, but that if she wanted to get access to an abortion, she was going to have to find a ride five hours away uh, to Albuquerque, New, New Mexico, um, or a military woman on base in El Paso who uh, was the uh, survivor of sexual assault but could not even talk to her doctor about terminating the pregnancy uh, because under the bounty system in Texas, anyone who assists someone in accessing abortion services um, could, be, could be turned into the local officials. Women who are putting their entire family, women who've never left the state of Texas, now piling their entire families into cars and driving uh, to Colorado um, and to states they've never been to in order to access safe and legal abortion or the high-risk OBGYN I spoke to just last week talking about um, her patients, people with desperately wanted pregnancies, with medical complications late in pregnancy, having literally no access um, to abortion uh, and having to talk to them and only talk to doctors that, that she could trust um, in the state and across the country. Because of course, in Texas, it's illegal for anyone to assist someone getting an abortion. Um, which leads me to the third most important thing we have to do, and maybe it is the most important thing to do, and that is we have to tell people why this happened and who did it to them. This was not some right-wing group of extremists, although you could call that the Republican Party at this point. This was the Republican Party. They have been trying for decades to end access to safe and legal abortion, and now it looks like in many parts of the country, um, they were going to succeed. And it's no longer Mississippi and Texas. If you have a Republican governor and a Republican legislature, this could be coming uh, to a theater near you. Um, so my advice is uh, for any of you who are thinking about running for office, um, my counsel is it has never been a better time and it's never been a more important time to be a progressive leader in this country uh, and stand up for our values. And that's what voters want. I think we are seeing that in primaries across the country. Um, being on the side of abortion rights is a winning issue. Um, one in four women in this country have had an abortion and that includes a lot of Republicans and that includes a lot of independent voters just for starters. But we know in state after state, um, and we, we did this work at Planned Parenthood, even states that consider themselves conservative, they do not want the government in charge of pregnancies in America. And that's what the Republican, parties, uh, Republican Party um, has planned. And of course, all their rhetoric, um, it's all been laid bare now. This wasn't just words. This is actually what they are putting into effect in half the country. Um, Republicans are trying to re recreate our country without a democracy, and we simply will not let them, and we cannot let them. Um, so if you're on the fence, uh, just do it, um, just run. Uh, run for self, something can help you every step of the way, from coaching uh, to mentorship, to introducing you to this incredible uh, group of people across the country who have been run for something candidates and who want to support you and help you win. Um, and they will change your life. So I'm proud of all of you. Um, our country, our, our communities, our people deserve better than what we're getting from the Republican party. Um, so I'm ready to support you as well. And thanks for having me tonight. And thanks for this important conversation. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so, so much, Cecil, for that incredibly empowering and inspiring message um, to everyone here today. Um, we need you all in the fight to run for office. Cecil Richards told you you could do it and the run for something would help you every step of the way. And that is true. That is what we're here for. We are so grateful Cecil, for your leadership, for your wisdom, and for your guidance and your inspiration. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, we want to start transitioning into the next section of our program, and that is going to be a panel discussion with people who have run for office based on reproductive rights, who are currently serving in office, and people who are actively running. Um, so this part of our portion is going to be moderated by Ana Eskamani, State House of Representatives District 47 member. Um, I'm gonna go through and do some bios of everyone who's hopping on our call today, and then we'll go ahead and get started. 
Um, I, as a Floridian, am incredibly grateful for the work that Anna Eskamani does every single day in our state house. Um, she's a lifelong Orlando native and the daughter of immigrants who has worked relentlessly her entire life to protect all members of our community through effective advocacy, bold leadership, and strategic management. Anna is a community organizer with a proven track record in building consensus while fighting unapologetically for progressive values. Before becoming an elected representative, Anna served as the Senior Director of Public Affairs and Communications for Planned Parenthood of Southwest and Central Florida. So everybody say, hey, Anna. We're so happy you're here tonight. Thank All you right. so much. It's an honor to be here. Yes, so Anna is going to be our moderator, and she is going to be talking to a rock star who is homegrown out of Texas, who we're so excited about as a current run for something candidate, and that is Becca Moyer DeFelice. She is running for Texas House District 121. Um, she is a middle class working mom. We were just talking about the middle school scaries before the call started. Um, Becca believes that it's time for the Texas legislature to prioritize the issues that are impacting our families every day. As an advocate, she's proven she can deliver for Texas family through her years of advocacy with Moms Demand Action and with her work with the state senator Roland Gutierrez on State Bill 1380, a rural mental health bill that passed the legislature last session. Adopted at 16 months old, Becca grew up on a working family farm in rural Pennsylvania, becoming a naturalized citizen at age six. In 2006, Becca and her husband moved to Texas's newlyweds in 2010, and in 2010, their daughter was born in San Antonio. Becca's working class background and years of community organizing and advocacy at the legislature give her the knowledge of what everyday Texans value and the ability to get those issues addressed. So welcome, Becca. We're so happy you're here. We're, I think this is your first appearance as a member of the Run for Something family. So welcome to the fold. We're so excited you're here. Thank you. Awesome. Good stuff. And then last but not least, we have a favorite in the Run for Something Slack, <laughs> um, Ellie Savitt, who is the Washtenaw County Prosecuting Attorney in Michigan. Um, Ellie is the prosecutor where he in the county where he was born and raised. He's laid out one of the most comprehensive criminal justice reform platforms that we've ever seen unveiled by a candidate for prosecutor in Michigan. His plans include eliminating cash bail, support for addiction and mental health treatments, and eradicating racial and socioeconomic inequality and plea bargain reform. Now, he was a former clerk to the notorious RBG, and he's a nationally respected lawyer and law professor. He serves as a senior legal counsel for the city of Detroit, overseeing thousands of public interest lawsuits and led the city's criminal justice reform work. And he is a lecturer at the University of Michigan. So welcome, Ellie. We're so excited you're here. All right, good stuff. So that is everyone we have now. We may have one more special guest pop in a little later. So I'm gonna hand it over now to Anna to get the, to get the party started because you all don't wanna hear from Run For Something. You all wanna hear from people who are going to do exactly what each of you have done, which is run for office. <laughs> Take it away, Anna. Well, thank you so much, Whitney. And it's such an honor to be with everyone tonight. And I'm just so humbled by uh, my fellow panelists. And so thank you so much for making the time. And uh, we're in multiple time zones tonight. So it is 820 Eastern time. And I know from coast to coast, we are all doing whatever we can to protect reproductive freedom and fight unapologetically for the values that we were elected and are working to be elected to uphold. And again, my name is Ana V. Eskamani. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, as it was mentioned, I worked at Planned Parenthood um, for six years before I ran for office. And before I worked at Planned Parenthood, I was a Planned Parenthood patient. So these issues are incredibly personal and important to me. And I feel thrilled. There are so many people who are interested in running for office um, as, a, as a reaction to uh, the potential SCOTUS leak and to the potential dismantling of the protections established under Roe v. Wade. Because the antidote to despair is action, is finding ways to uh, um, grow our power in pain, not to sit in despair or sit um, in stagnation. And so I'm so grateful that everyone is 
picking up this mantle and is here tonight because they have an interest in, in getting um, not only more involved, but running for office themselves. And so with that, I, I want to get started with a question just for both of our um, panelists, and hopefully we can welcome um, an additional speaker during the conversation. But I guess my first question is, what does reproductive rights mean to you? And, and Becca, I'm going to go to you first as someone who is um, running in Texas. Oh my goodness, Tierra is actually joining us. Um, you know, why don't I just read, if it's okay with uh, uh, Ellie and Becca, why don't I introduce Tiara real quick, and then we'll get the conversation started. Okay. You do not miss a thing. We were just getting started. So let me introduce our third panelist for tonight. So this is um, uh, Tiara Mack from the Rhode Island Senate in District 6. So Tiara is a formerly low wealth black queer educator and activist who ran for office to bring stories and experiences like hers to the Rhode Island State House. As an activist, she will continue to fight and connect her policies to the real issues that create and maintain injustice. As a former math and sex educator, quality and inclusive education are the core of her work and is a source of her passion for self-advocacy and activism. She understands that we need bold, visionary leaders that will think beyond what has been done and look to do and create innovative change in how society works for all, but in particular, the most oppressed currently through policy. And so we're so grateful you could join us and what a fantastic panel uh, for us to be amplifying tonight. And so again, that first question to Becca, um, how do you define reproductive rights? What do reproductive rights mean to you? So I really loved that you mentioned that you're a Planned Parenthood, not just a former employee, but also a former patient. And I have a similar story where I was a former Planned Parenthood patient. Um, I think that to me, reproductive rights mean that every person in the state of Texas has the ability and the access to determine their own reproductive future and health. So we are not just talking about abortion rights when we're talking about reproductive justice. We are talking about access to reproductive health care in a state that has severely underfunded health care. We have over half the counties in the state have no OBGYN in residence. There are 35 counties in Texas that have no physician at all. So when we talk about the abortion bans, we are talking about a cruel, extreme measure that will affect people who are most lacking healthcare access already. Um, I could literally talk about this all day long. I am going to keep myself brief out of respect for my other panelists. But um, I do want to say thank you so much for having me today. Well, and I think that is such a great point. When we talk about reproductive justice, it's not just about the ability when or when not to become a parent, but also the ability to raise your child in an environment conducive to their health and well-being. And in the case of Texas and so many communities across the country, there is so much injustice that our attention should go towards versus um, the efforts to, to ban abortion and take away what is a really important option for families to have. Um, I'm going to go to um, Ellie next and then Tiara. Same question. What does reproductive rights mean to you? Well, so, so, so simply put, reproductive freedom means that everybody should have the opportunity to decide when, whether, and under what circumstances they're going to have and raise a child. Now, I'm, I'm the DA, right? I'm the county prosecutor. And so obviously that means that we should not be criminalizing and prosecuting one's exercise of reproductive freedom, but that's not all. I mean, we need to have access to reproductive care for everyone. Frankly, the state of affairs in the United States right now, even pre-Roe being overturned, is such that reproductive care is accessible easily to some and not to others. And that state of affairs is only gonna be exacerbated uh, when and if the United States Supreme Court overrules or guts Row. So, uh, you know, reproductive freedom at the end of the day uh, means what I said, but also means that everybody should be able to access that, that you shouldn't have to travel across state lines or long distances within a state, that it should be accessible and available and funded for everybody, regardless of their socioeconomic status, uh, because, you know, rights are rights and rights should be able to be exercised by everybody, certainly without fear of criminal prosecution, um, but they should also be readily accessible. 
I have to say it is so refreshing to have a DA who gets it, but also to have a DA that uh, has a, a background in reproductive justice and, and embodies that in their work. And I, I hope it inspires folks here in the Zoom room to consider every level of government, because I know a lot of emphasis goes to legislative bodies, but every level of government can play a, a really important role here. Um, Senator Mack, and please let me know if I'm pronouncing your first name um, incorrectly. And I don't know if it's, I don't wanna get it wrong. So please, please correct me, um, but we're honored to have you. I wanna, I wanna give you the same question. What does reproductive rights mean to you? Yes, reproductive rights and reproductive justice to me means um, everyone has the opportunities and the communities to build the families that they want to build free of any economic barriers, social barriers, um, and work barriers. I am an abortion fundraiser. I've been a member of an abortion fund in Rhode Island since 2016. I've also worked for Planned Parenthood and I've given people the literal tools that they need in order to make the best decision for themselves. Whether that is being able to um, afford the procedures that they want to, having the, uh, the education as a former sex educator, giving people the tools in order to determine when, how, and if they decide to become parents and what families they want to create. As a legislator, working to make sure that um, reproductive rights is not just happening in the vacuum. It's not just about the reproductive system. It's about making sure that every parent has enough money, a living wage in order to pay for um, the houses and the shelter that are providing, that they're gonna provide for their families in the future or and or now it's making sure that there are um, there's clean water there's clean air in every single community it's making sure that there's transportation it's making sure that there is a living wage it's making sure that we are not criminalizing um, mothers and fathers simply for not being able to afford rent or pay for health care it's access to affordable health care reproductive rights does not happen just in the vacuum it's everything that happens before after and during a person's life and so that's why we need more and more politicians who understand that none of these decisions are happening in a vacuum. We need every single level, level of our legislation um, and of our criminal processes to understand that every single person needs not only the economic resources, but the social resources in order to make the best decision for themselves and their future. Absolutely. And I just want you to know you're getting so much love in the chat. And so please, please, please make sure folks, uh, you see the, the love that you're getting. Um, and actually, I want to, I want to kind of, you know, jump on the points that you're making with another question, if I can, Senator. Um, so you serve in the Rhode Island State Legislature. And, uh, you know, most folks see Rhode Island as a quote, blue state, right? Uh, but we know that, you know, even living in a democratic led state, it does not automatically guarantee access to abortion. And this is a really important point, you know, even under the protections of Roe v. Wade it does not mean every person has clear access to an abortion as you outlined um, in your reproductive justice framing. And so can you speak a little more about how does abortion access or lack of access affect historically marginalized and low wealth communities? Yes, um, I can see directly to that. So I ran for office because the person who I ran against in 2020 was anti-choice and anti-LGBTQ. And as an abortion fundraiser and as an employee of Planned Parenthood, I did not see that as someone who represented the best interests of me or of my communities. And um, in Rhode Island in 2019, we codified Roe v. Wade, which ensured the right to abortion in our state. And we still had Democrats who were endorsed by right to life and who would not stand up for a person's right to choose. Right now in Rhode Island, one third of Rhode Islanders do not have access to abortion services in their health care plans because we have an exemption for state employees and Medicaid recipients. So low income folks and folks who are state employees in Rhode Island do not have access to um, abortion. That's one third of our population. 33% of Rhode Islanders do not have authentic choice in our state. So though we codified Roe v. Wade in 2019, we still have a long way to go to make sure that every single Rhode Islander, regardless regardless of their income status, regardless of what type of job they have, have clear, authentic choice to make the decisions that fit their lifestyle, their families, and the families they want to create. Um, and so there have been so many Rhode Islanders that even 
um, before the looming decision for the overturning of Roe v. Wade have lived in a post-Roe America because they haven't had authentic choice through their health care insurance um, or their health care provider provided through the state or through the state Medicaid program. And, and that's a shame and we should not stigmatize anyone, no matter um, if they are a state employee or however much money they're making. We should ensure that every single person free of any barrier should have access to authentic bodily autonomy and choice and determining what families they want to create. Amen, 100%. And I, I so appreciate um, this point that you made that choice is not a reality even today for every person, right? Including in blue states. And that, you know, you should be inspired to run in every state because there are districts who need better advocates, right? Um, especially voices who are uh, from a, a generation that is more intentional and inclusive and is looking at the holistic issue at hand versus something more transactional. And so I really appreciate you uplifting that. And I know you you um, might not already know this, but I also am a Planned Parent alum. So just shout out to the PP family. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump over to uh, uh, Becca, who is again a candidate in Texas. She Becca is running for the Texas legislature, which all eyes have been on Texas, right, for this past year. Um, and of course, with the recent tragedy of Uvalde, the shooting Uvalde, I also want um, you to know that our hearts are with you and we're also fighting for common sense gun safety legislation um, in our states and across the country. And abortion access in Texas has been under attack for years, but of course, Senate Bill 8 has taken um, the entire nation um, in, of concern. I mean, it, it, looking at recent polling, more Americans have heard about Senate Bill 8 in Texas than they've heard about the leaked SCOTUS case. Like all eyes are on Texas. And so I wanna ask you, um, you know, as you're running for the Texas legislature, a state again, that is known to be traditionally very conservative and one with a trigger law um, that will outlaw abortion within 30 days if Roe is overturned. I want to ask you, and you know, this is from a Florida girl to a Texas girl, like how can people living in red states support reproductive rights and abortion access in their communities, whether it's at a political level or even it's a direct service level in their communities? So um, definitely the eyes of the nation have been on Texas in all the wrong ways over the past year. Um, I live in San Antonio, I'm running in San Antonio. Uh, Uvalde is about an hour and 20 minutes away from um, where I live, and I'm raising a young girl who is in the public school system. So every issue in Texas is a crucially important issue. Everything that our legislature decides upon is critically important to my household, to my community, and that's really why I step forward to run for this seat. Um, Texas wasn't always a red state. I think it's really important to remember that, and our keynote speaker could certainly attest to the fact that we were a democratic state and we are finding our way back despite the gerrymandering, despite this voter suppression. And we're running close races. And in seats like mine, we are seeing in a very real way that we have a path to victory because Texans pride themselves on personal freedom. These laws are a direct assault to our personal freedom. And you know, I'm running against somebody who sits on the public health committee who has a deciding vote in that committee. And I'm running in a district that is very strongly pro-choice. So had the incumbent voted with the values of his district on a single one of the abortion bills, they would have died in committee. This is a very clear case of someone being elected and then serving themselves and their personal interests over the values of their community. But until we can regain a majority, and it's up to us to regain control of the narrative, because for way too long, we have allowed abortion and gun safety to be the third rail of politics, right? Like, candidates were told not to talk about those two issues, always couch it. We cannot couch things, we cannot be delicate, we cannot tiptoe around these issues anymore, because we have seen exactly where we ended up. So we need to talk about abortion. We need to be open and honest about the impact that this has on Texans and about the fact that this has the potential to thrust so many Texas families into generational poverty. 
we need to talk about the fact that our legislature already introduced a death penalty bill for people who seek out abortion services. These are very real issues that we need to talk about because they are no longer this extreme, unthought of, incomprehensible policy. This is now a reality. So, you know, we need to talk about it. We need to support legislation that will ensure that people who seek out abortion services are not criminalized. We need to make sure that our physicians are protected if they do provide that service. We need to protect our right to contraception because we know that that is on the line. And we need to support the abortion funds and the education orgs that are doing the hard work in Texas every day, like Planned Parenthood and Avow and the funds like Lilith Fund and Fund Texas Choice. We are at a critical moment and we know that Texas has had an outsized voice on this issue. We can find our way back to a place where we are valuing our citizens again, but it takes every single one of us to start pushing out the message that we can win this fight. We just have to keep working. Thank you so much for that, Becca. I'm so excited you are running and <laughs> And I, and I, and I know we all know it's not easy. And for those who are, you know, already running or thinking of running, um, you are not alone Run for something is here to support you. And, and I'm so inspired by, um, your words. And I just want to amplify one of the points you made around, you might not always be able to control the votes in the chamber within a red state, but you can control the narrative. You can help shape the narrative and through abortion storytelling, um, through being out loud and apolog and unapologetic on these issues we can help break abortion stigma and make it easier for people to share their stories, make it easier for abortion funds to get the support they need. And for far too long, Democrats have shied away from these conversations. They don't even say the A word, right? They call it something else. Um, and so kudos to everyone here for being so bold and helping to not only fight for access to abortion, but break that stigma too. Um, and so I'm gonna go back to our DA, um, and again, very excited to have you here. I, I, I see the admiration for you in the chat as well. Um, you know, as a, as a prosecutor in your county, in the state of Michigan, what opportunities would you say exist for elected officials in the criminal justice and judicial realms to help protect abortion access? Yeah, uh, well, I wanna start by saying this very simply. Uh, you got to ask your local DA, are you ever going to prosecute abortion? Uh, and if they say yes, or if they say, well, gosh, I don't know, it's a case by case basis. Or if they say some crap like, oh, you know, well, I took an oath of office and I have to apply all the laws equally. No, they don't. No, they don't. Uh, prosecutors have discretion about which charges to file and under what circumstances. And they can make a pledge, as I have done, as some of my colleagues across Michigan and across the country have done, to say, I will never, ever prosecute abortion. Now, why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, prosecutors can always make a decision that is in the interest of justice. That's not just something that like they can do. It's something you're required to do. And I can't think of anything that is more unjust than prosecuting, criminally prosecuting somebody with what in Michigan would be a felony for something that has been expressly recognized as a fundamental right by the United States Supreme Court for the last 50 years. People have organized their lives, people have organized their families, their relationships around the right to an abortion and to turn around and say, we're all of a sudden gonna criminalize you for having one or criminalize a doctor for providing one flies squarely in the face of what justice provides. But look, uh, there's other reasons not to prosecute abortion too. And, you know, I would encourage anybody to confront your local TA or your local, uh, you know, ju judicial actors with this too. We all know that prohibitionist policies don't work for anything, right? Uh, what they do is they make it more dangerous. We know that from the pre row era with abortion. People aren't gonna stop seeking abortion uh, once it is criminalized, but it moves it into the shadows. It makes it less likely that they can get medical help 
if there are complications. It makes it more likely that somebody will carry a dangerous pregnancy to term, which means that people's lives and their health are at risk. Now, as a prosecutor, I'm charged with protecting the health and safety and welfare of my community, as are all prosecutors. And prosecuting abortion, which we know criminalization of abortion is going to make things more dangerous. It's going to result in health complications, it's going to result potentially in lives lost. That flies in the face of your duty as a prosecutor. So this needs to be front and center. Uh, frankly, I think in every DA's race, in every county prosecutor's race across the country, these questions need to be asked and people need to give an honest, straight answer to it because communities need to know whether they're going to be facing criminal liability for the exercise of a fundamental right um, that has been protected expressly for the last half century. In Michigan, you know, we're a purple state, right? Uh, we got the excellent Democratic governor, attorney general, secretary of state, right? Um, Republican legislature, so purple, right? Um, but this is an issue in Michigan, not because we have a trigger law, but because we actually have an old 1931 law that will spring back into effect immediately if Roe is overturned. There are these old laws on the books, there are trigger laws on the books, and there are plots to get new laws on the books that restrict abortions across the country. So ultimately, uh, the people that are in charge with enforcing these laws are your local DAs, are your local prosecutors. And I don't care where you live, right? You may think you live in a blue state, but, but who knows how quickly the winds can change and some DAs stay in place for decades, right? This is the question that has to be asked of any county prosecutor, of any DA. Uh, and, you know, frankly, if they're, if they're not willing to stand up for their constituents' health, safety, welfare, uh, and exercise of reproductive freedom, uh, you probably need a new DA and a new county prosecutor. And if you do, hit me up because I can probably help. Well said. Well said, Ellie. And it just reminds me, too, around, like, you know, Abortion access has changed so much over the years, and we are seeing um, uh, new efforts to make abortion by pill available without having to go to a clinic. And this is becoming an option that folks are seeking, especially in states like Texas. And so to your point about criminalizing abortion, are you going to prosecute someone who accessed abortion by pill you know, from an online source or, or maybe from a different state and, and brought it to Texas? Like if the answer is yes, then you, we got to vote that person out, right? I mean, th these are people who are also like seeking bodily autonomy in an environment where um, there is there is an unjust law that has been signed by those who are in power, not representing the majority attitudes, but representing um, essentially a extreme base of voters. And so to to put DAs on the spot and to make this an election question. You know, every town hall, and in the case of Florida, we have state attorneys, um, but, you know, same thing, different names. And we made sure in the last campaign cycle to actually integrate into town halls with our state attorneys questions about would you prosecute someone who ended their own pregnancy? Um, and so I think it's such an excellent point that you uplift. And um, I want to remind folks that we are going to be taking your questions very soon. They already see questions coming into the, um, the Q&A box. So thank you for that. Um, we're going to go around the team here real quick um, with a final question. I do think we have a poll that we want to launch. So um, let's do a quick poll, make sure folks are uh, plugged in and engaged. And so um, I'm gonna go ahead and toss it uh, back to, I think Whitney's gonna lead us to the poll and let's do that quick community poll with everyone. Yeah, hey everyone. So it's Whitney, a friend of or something. Um, and so we are going to launch a poll on your screen. You're gonna have about 45 seconds to a minute to respond. And here's what the run for something team wants to know. Are you ready, especially after everything you've heard tonight, after how you've heard you can help from a state legislative level, you can help from a district attorney level. There are ways city council members and school board members and library board members can all help fight for reproductive rights and justice. We want to know if you're ready to run for office. So a poll is going to pop up, Tyler's gonna throw it up 
And the first question says, I'm planning to run and will be on the ballot this year in 2022. I'm planning to run and I'll be on the ballot in 2023. I'm interested in running for office and I'm ready to start learning how to run a successful campaign and said, or I just started thinking about learning um, or thinking about running for office and I'm kind of ready to learn more. And I just, just started thinking about it. Um, or no, I'm not gonna run for office. Um, go ahead, take your time now, fill in an answer. That is going to determine how Run For Something follows up with you and how we can get you support as quickly as possible. Um, Run For Something has endorsed over 2,000 races. We've, we've elected over 600 young people to office and we're ready to help you. So go ahead, let's take about 10 more seconds answer that question and then we'll pop back into the poll or back into the panel. Okay, all right, back over to you, Anna. Thank you so much. Looking forward to seeing that data um, and see where folks are at. So I have one last question before we open up um, to the questions that came in from our attendees. And so we're gonna go around the panelists. And of course, you know, we gotta try to keep our answers um, concise and I know we're running out of time, but it is a really important question that I do not want to ignore. And it's, can you tell us about a time in which your stance on abortion access had a significant impact for your community? So let's localize this and think about when has abortion access had a significant impact that stood out to you in your community? And um, Senator, I'm gonna go to you first and then I'll go to Becca next and back to Ellie. Yes, I think right now is the moment where abortion has had a significant impact on, on my community. Um, in Rhode Island, we did codify the right to abortion in state law in 2019, but I represent a predominantly Black, Latinx, low-income, single-family community, and they have not had ac authentic access to abortion services um, even before we codified the the um, even before we codified uh, Roe v. Wade into state law, and even. Um, after. So it is always an issue, especially for low income, black and brown, historically marginalized communities who um, historically don't have access to quality education, quality health care access, um, good schools, clean water, lead free pipes. It's it has always been a critical issue that, that the families that I represent do not have the resources they need in order to create the families that they want to in a safe and healthy manner. Um, and even now that we're facing um, um, a, a rise and an epidemic of gun violence. We don't have families who can raise their black and brown babies and have confidence that they won't grow up to be shot in a grocery store or to be shot in their school. That is why I fight for reproductive health because every single person in our communities and reproductive justice, reproductive justice, including abortion, is about fighting for all of those issues um, for every single person in our communities, no matter how much money they make, no matter their zip code, no matter uh, what jobs they have, no matter how far they travel for work. It should be a reality for every single person that we represent um, at every single time. The pandemic has just illuminated that there are more people who are um, experiencing uh, low income status, who have trouble paying for groceries, that have trouble paying for rent, that have trouble accessing health care. And so it is always been an issue, but right now in this moment is even more paramount that we fight as hard as we can to make sure that there are no financial barriers, there are no social barriers uh, to accessing abortion services in every single community, particularly the most historically marginalized. Well said, Senator. Um, Becca, can you give us uh, your perspective on this? Sure thing. Um, I do have to say that Senator Mack's responses are like a masterclass on intersectionality, and I could listen to you literally all day. Um, so the impact of abortion access is absolutely impacting this race right now. And the SCOTUS leak absolutely led to a lot of independent soft R women reaching out to us. And this is the thing. I close every single house party, every single time that I talk to potential constituents with this message. If you are in this room, if you know a person who can become pregnant, I need to know that you care for that person and respect that person enough to believe that they deserve equal rights to you. And this is your moment of reckoning. Can you vote for an individual who believes 
that just because a person can become pregnant, that they should be a second class citizen in this country. That reframes the narrative in a way that is honest and raw and makes a lot of people reassess their decision to vote for their 401k over the people in their lives who can get pregnant. Thank you for that, Becca. Ali. You know, I've, I've probably had more people reaching out to me about this issue over the last month and a half than any other issue since I've been prosecuted. Um, and, you know, that's not for lack of some other stuff that we've done uh, in, in our administration. But people are terrified right now. And that's something that I think everybody that is in office, everybody that is running for office has to realize. People are afraid that a right that they grew up thinking was fundamental, thinking was sacrosanct, thinking was going to be recognized by the US Supreme Court and that the court meant what it said is going to be taken away from them. People have ordered their lives around the right to an abortion. And they're scared that that's gonna be taken away from them. I've got two major universities. Uh, so I've got a lot of people of reproductive age, young people in my jurisdiction. And I've had parents reaching out to me, scared about their children and whether they may face criminal prosecution if they need to access an abortion while they're away at college. Now, I want to be clear about this because uh, people are scared and by and large, uh, though anybody that takes a strong stance on abortion knows you're going to get some pushback from the other side and you're going to get some nasty people saying, you know, uh, whatever, right? But by and large, my community at least uh, has been grateful for the strong stance that we have taken around the criminalization of abortion and just categorically not prosecuting, not prosecuting a patient, not prosecuting a provider, not prosecuting doctors, right? But, you know, that's the lowest hanging fruit because it's not like not prosecuting abortion means that access to abortion is going to remain what it is. I think we gotta be honest about this. Uh, and this is what I try to try to tell my constituents is like, look, I, you, you got my word, I'm just not prosecuting, right? I can't promise that clinic is gonna stay open because there's issues with insurance. There's issues with admitting privileges if you're operating a violation of a law that remains on the books. So, you know, from the criminal justice perspective, from a DA's perspective, um, this is something that I know is reassuring to a great many residents of my community. But from a broader perspective, you know, people are just terrified right now. And if you're a candidate and if you're in elected office, you got to realize that. And no matter what your role is to play in this, and for some of us, it's legislative, some of us, it's, it, it's enforcement, you know, um, some of us, it's litigation, right? Whatever your role to play in it is, um, you got to do it. You got to recognize it um, because this is something that is just top of mind for so many people right now, because indeed the Supreme Court got it right in 1973. This is something that is fundamental to so many people. Thank you so much, Ellie. So well said. And now we're going to um, break into taking your questions from the audience. But real quick, I'm going to toss it back to Whitney to share the results from the poll that we did um, about five minutes ago. So I'm super curious to see uh, what folks are thinking about when it comes to running for office. And so, oh, there we go. Um, look at those results. So we have... Um, 15% uh, I am planning to run and will be on the ballot in 2022. Uh, we have 8% saying I'm going to, I'm planning to run, but you'll see me on the ballot in 2023. And then the bulk of folks who are attending are interested in running for office and are ready to learn more about how to run a successful campaign. And you've come to the right spot uh, with run for something. And uh, we also have folks who I just started thinking of running for office and want to learn more. And then no, thanks. Not interested in running for office at this time at 9%. And these are folks who are clearly uh, engaged and want to help others uh, reach that finish line. So we appreciate folks uh, participating. And let's go ahead and dive into these questions. So uh, the first question, and, and you know, honestly, whoever wants to take it, just, you know, unmute yourself and 
Um, and and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll play by ear to see if there's folks who want to add more to your response. Um, but the first question comes from Brian. What kind of community knowledge is most important or necessary when it comes to running for office? And what about the social or professional networks that can help? And so you can answer this question in the context of, um, you know, reproductive freedom or just more um, in general, but I'm curious, you might want to help to provide some insight to this question on community knowledge that you need to run for office. Yeah, I can, I can chime in. I ran in 2020 um, during the global pandemic. And though I had been an activist and though I'd been working on, um, I'd worked on several other campaigns before, I didn't have the institutional knowledge as a young queer black woman um, at the age of 25 when I first decided to run and 26 when I was elected. Um, there, were, there were no spaces carved out in the political scene for a young queer black openly unapologetic abortion fundraising person to run for office. But I knocked on every single door and found people like me who resonated with my background and who knew that they wanted representation that um, was more representative of their lived experience and their background. So though there is a there is a good old boys club, you do not have to conform. You do not have to assimilate. You can be your unapologetic self fighting for the issues that you want to fight about, um, whether it is abortion access, whether it's clean water, whether it is uh, more transparency in our, in our government. Those are all reasons why I ran. And there is no, you have to know this person, you have to be able to do this. It comes down to knocking on all of the doors, having a solid argument and connecting with people through your story. Absolutely. So well said, Senator. And I'll just add to that too. You know, you 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 want to understand your community, and door knocking is one of the best ways to do that. And door knocking is kind of like uh, grassroots polling because you really get a feel for you know what your community is feeling and thinking, and what are they prioritizing that you can uplift in your platform. But be yourself, live your values, and if there are areas that are important to your community that you don't feel like you have you know insight on find the folks who can help you, who are experts, um, and, and build your team with those folks in mind. And so, um, uh, you know, we're sending you all the good vibes, but uh, um, everyone has the capacity to do this. And for far too long, we have incredibly unqualified, wealthy people in these positions. And that's what we're trying to change um, by working with organizations like Rent for Something. I'm gonna go um, to Becca with this next question um, from Katie. If we are living in a more progressive state with less risk of the same limitations, like Texas, for example, how can we support other states? So what, what would be your ask to folks who want to help you win um, who are in other states? So um, I think somebody just yelled donate in the, in the chat. And we have to be honest about that as candidates, so much of what we do is fundraising. And if you are someone like me who is middle class, came from a working class background, we don't have access to the networks that say a older white male successful attorney has. Um, not naming names to my incumbent. So <laughs> we have that, but we also have the ability because so much is digital now, if you can text for us or phone bank for us, if you can share graphics on social media, if you can retweet us, things like that are so helpful, but very specific to reproductive justice. If you are able to support a abortion fund in the state of Texas or an abortion provider in a state where abortion is still legal, please do so because so many of the people in those 26 states that where abortion will be completely banned are going to need to come to your state to receive that healthcare service. So I'm pretty sure that my fundraiser would be yelling at me right now for saying that, but let's be honest, it takes all of us to keep everybody protected. Absolutely, Becca, and I think it's so important for those of us who are candidates who obviously are raising money and need those funds to also use our bully pulpit to raise money for abortion funds, um, front and center, right? Like the direct service providers. Um, and remember, for those who don't know, abortion funds are not just helping cover the cost of the procedure, they're helping to cover the cost of travel, of uh, potential childcare, of hotel stays, because 
in Florida, our governor signed a 15 week abortion ban into law. A lawsuit was just filed today, but the closest option for Floridians to seek an abortion after 15 weeks is going to be North Carolina. And so supporting abortion funds helps those folks get to where they need to be and have that entire wraparound system of support as well. Um, so Ellie, I'm gonna go to you next with this question. And this question is actually specifically for you um, from Tammy. I'd like to hear Ellie's perspective on how the laws that will potentially go in effect in Michigan if when Roe is overturned and what can we as Michigan residents do to help? So what is the lay of the land in Michigan if SCOTUS does overturn or gut Roe and how can Michigan residents help? Yeah, so, 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 so great question. Um, if the Supreme Court overrules Roe, then there is an old 1931 law, which, and actually I say it's 1931, everybody says 1931, it's really 1844. They just recodified it in 1931. So think about that. This is a law from 1844, and you can, you can tell that it's archaic because it, it uses archaic language around inducing miscarriage or whatever. It's a law from 1844. Okay, so uh, that is still exists. What a lot of people don't realize is that when the Supreme Court uh, of the United States rules that a certain set of laws are unconstitutional, those don't get like erased from the statute books. Those don't, those don't get erased from the law books. They're still there. They're just sort of zombie laws, right? Which can't be enforced because of what the Supreme Court said, in this case, in Roe, that the old law in Michigan can't be enforced, but they're still there. And the issue is that if Roe is overturned, then that can spring back into effect. And that law makes at least the provision of an abortion, uh, so it criminalizes the provider. Uh, it may well be interpreted to criminalize the patient as well. Nobody really knows. And uh, it, it almost certainly criminalizes um, uh, uh, medication-induced abortion. So, so that law threatens to spring back into effect in Michigan the day that Roe is overturned. So that's the lay of the land. Now, the good thing is there are a number of fights that are going on in Michigan around this. There are two active lawsuits, one brought by Planned Parenthood, one brought by the governor uh, to seek to declare that law, that old law invalid under the Michigan constitution, right? Um, so even if the uh, US Supreme Court says the US constitution doesn't protect the right to an abortion, the Michigan Supreme Court can always say the Michigan constitution does. Great news recently on that front is that uh, a judge issued in a, a preliminary injunction in the Planned Parenthood lawsuit saying that that law can't be enforced uh, until that injunction is lifted. So as things stand right now, if the Supreme Court overrules Roe tomorrow, that injunction fortunately would allow providers to stay open in Michigan. So it's complicated, right? Uh, and we're involved in litigation. We've been filing in support of the governor's lawsuit. Uh, you know, hopefully this can get resolved by the Michigan Supreme Court in a way that does not actually uh, end up restricting access to abortion in Michigan for any period of time. But you asked directly what people can do. And this is by far the most important thing that you can do if you live in Michigan right now, if you are concerned about access to abortion in Michigan right now, there is a ballot initiative. It's called MI Reproductive Freedom. Go to mireproductivefreedom.org and help in any way you can. What this ballot initiative would do is expressly amend the Michigan constitution to protect the right to an abortion. That means no matter what a future court says about the Michigan constitution or whatever, it's there, it's in there, it's protected. They're in the process right now of gathering signatures, right? So if you can volunteer and help them gather signatures to get this on the ballot in November, that's crucial. If you can't do that, gathering signatures, running a campaign costs a lot of money. Donate money to them. Uh, that's the most important thing right now in Michigan because that is our most sustainable long-term solution. We all know this, right? Courts can flip-flop on their decisions. Even if the Michigan Supreme Court does what we hope that it does and protects the right to an abortion uh, in Michigan, look at what the Supreme Court is doing, right? They can flip-flop in future years. But if we get that in the constitution right there in black and white, the right to an abortion is protected, that is what's going to 
long term ensure continued uh, provision of reproductive services in Michigan. Am I reproductivefreedom.org? I'll drop it in the chat too. You're amazing. Thanks so much for that, Ali. And we're going to take one more question from the audience, and I have a closing thought that I want everyone to share. Um, so why don't we grab um, David's question about the larger question of what overtoning Roe will mean to individual rights and privacy. And I think this speaks to the intersectionality that Senator Mack was highlighting earlier, because as we saw in the leaked SCOTUS draft majority opinion, that there were other court cases being cited that are tied to LGBTQ plus rights. And of course, we've heard commentary from Republicans around contraception and even interracial marriage. Um, and so I'm not sure who might wanna tackle this, but perhaps highlighting how abortion is connected to other collective rights. And so if you strip away abortion, what are those other ramifications? What's the ripple effect? I don't know if anybody wants to tackle that one. I, Please. I'm, I'm a lawyer here. You guys, neither one of you guys are lawyers, right? Uh, <laughs> I feel okay. like I play one sometimes. Right, right, no. right. Okay, so please, so, please. So, so the issue is that uh, Roe was decided under a theory of uh, a legal theory called substantive due process, which basically says that there are rights that aren't written into the Constitution, so unenumerated rights that are so important that uh, the government cannot take them away, right? So substantive due process protects the right to an abortion. It's also been interpreted to protect the right to contraceptives and the right to marry the partner of one's choosing. So if Roe goes, and the way that Justice Alito's draft opinion was written calls into significant question the existence of rights protected by substantive due process. It threatens in the future the right to contraception, the right to same-sex marriage, because those opinions, Griswold versus Connecticut and Obergefell versus Hodges, were uh, based in whole or in part on this substantive due process right that has also been interpreted to protect the right to an abortion. Um, so look, this is, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a real threat. Uh, I can't emphasize enough what a right-wing conservative Supreme Court we have right now. Um, and folks that, you know, think, well, they'd never come after contraception. They've never come after, um, you know, same-sex marriage. Uh, I, I, I gotta tell you, um, you know, if you read Alito's opinion, it's squarely in the crosshairs. Uh, the, the, the way that some of the justices are thinking about it now, appear to be thinking about it right now, suggests that they, they don't care about the real world consequences um, and they're prepared to just gut this entire doctrine of substantive due process, which has protected so many rights that so many of us rely upon. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm not a lawyer and I do not play one on TV or on panels, um, but it just goes to show that we need more people who are community centered in positions of power to make sure that at the local level, at the city level, at the state level, that we have airtight um, legislation protecting each and every one of our communities. We cannot allow the simple overturning of a court case to determine how, when, and if people um, build their families, if they're able to get married, if they're able to marry someone of the opposite gender. Um, th these are all things that we need to protect on the local level. And that's why we need every single person running for city council, running for state representatives and for statewide offices, because we need to make sure that our communities are protected because we know what our communities need best. It's not a one size fits all metric. We can't just copy and paste from what the states um, that we admire that are doing the right things are doing. We have to make sure that our states, our cities, our communities are protected with the with the with the doctrine and with the tools and resources of folks who not only care about one issue, but we care about the intersection of every single issue that impacts the majority of people in the places where we live. 
So well said. And so we're running out of time. So I have one last closing question. I'm gonna go to Becca first for this and we'll go um, back around the panel. And thank you again to everyone who's joined us for this conversation and uh, to our incredible panelists and to Run For Something for hosting us. Um, so this closing question is, what advice would you share with people who are passionate about reproductive rights and are considering running for office themselves? Um, and so Becca, I'll go to you first. So I think that running for office is a big leap. No one ever feels totally ready to do this. Um, if you passionately believe that you can make a difference, that you know your community, that you have the moral courage to take a stand on the issues that you feel truly strongly about, then you have to do it. But the best advice that I could ever give is surround yourself with people who are also in it for the right reasons. Because we all know that the political realm is filled with people who are in it for whatever purpose. Find the people, the consultants, the volunteers, the campaign staffers, find the people who are true believers in democracy and progressive values and make sure that you are surrounded by those people so that on the days that you feel like there is no hope left, they will be there for you and they will lift you up because they believe in what you are doing as much as you do. Awesome. Have your village, have a village you can lean on. Ellie, what advice would you give? J jump in with both feet and uh, be true to yourself and let that passion guide you. I think so often, and you know, I think all of us that are on this panel probably realize this, you'll get negative pushback from people, right? That happens. Uh, people will criticize you. People will, you know, try to get you to moderate your, your stance. But at the end of the day, remember what got you into this race. If you are passionate about fighting for reproductive justice, fighting for the right to an abortion, run with that. Don't let somebody talk you off that. That's because like, you know, if you run on something that you believe in, that you're passionate about and you lose, okay, right? You stay true to yourself. Better that than to win and be somebody who you're not and lose the reason that you got into this in the first place. But also, I'll say this, voters respond well to passion and to honesty. And if you are honest about your passion around a particular issue, whether it's reproductive rights, whether it's any other issue, right? And you're passionate about it and you're open about that, even voters who may disagree with you will respect you and they may well vote for you. I had folks, you know, when, when I was on the campaign, they said, you know, I don't think I agree with you on every single issue, but I believe you're telling me what you're actually going to do. And at least I know. And so I'm going to vote for you. So keep that passion. Don't lose it and let it guide you. And I, and, and I, I can, I can guarantee you, you know, I'm not going to say everybody's going to win. Right. But I think by and large, candidates will be more successful if they keep that spark, run with it, and uh, are true to themselves throughout the campaign and throughout their time in office. Thank you for that, Ellie. Senator Mack, what yes. advice? Uh, well, similar to Ellie, do it and do it unapologetically. Do it as if the rights of everyone in the community that you were running in depend on it because they do. We've seen in the last few years in the last few election cycle that there are so many things at stake. So you have to do it, you have to run and you have to be an advocate unapologetically and as if the rights, the lives and the livelihood of the people that you're running for depend on it because quite frankly, they do. Um, we can't have people who are half in, half out. We can't have people who will back down to big lobbyists, who will back down to establishment folks, who will back down to the powers that be and who will um, bend to the beck and call of folks who are already in those positions of power who are not going to advocate for the people who really need it. You have to do it, you have to do it both Boldly, you have to do it bravely and you have to do it every single day alongside the community members that elect you and that believe in you because that is what we need and that's the change that we need in order to have every single community um, not only surviving but thriving in the current climate that we're living in. Um, so unapologetically 
uh, run unapologetically support the communities and uh, do it, do it well and do it every single day. So well said, so well said. And, and just to echo those comments, um, you know, lead with grit and grace, but know where you come from, ask for guidance, but trust your gut and uh, yeah, stand up, stand up for your community and center policy decisions on your community, on directly impacted people. And with that, I want to say thank you to our amazing, amazing panelists from uh, Senator Tara Mack to our DA, Ellie Savitt, to, of course, our candidate in Texas, uh, Becca Moyer, D. Felice. We are so grateful. Please follow all these folks online. Uh, drop them some coin, you know, support their efforts. Uh, spread the word if you have family who live in all these parts of um, the country. And of course, I am your moderator, Anna V. Eskamani from Orlando, representing District 47, the State House. So thank you so much for being here. And I will toss it uh, back to our Run for Something team to close us out. Y'all, that was incredible. Was it just me or were you snapping and just like the whole time? I was like, yes, like my fingers were like burning in the comment section. So I'm so, so grateful that you all are all here. We want to thank our panelists. We want to thank our moderator, Anna, Becca, Ellie, Tiara. We could not have done this without you. Thank you for sharing your experiences and your wisdom and just inspiring everyone to take action. Like the moment is now. Democracy is at stake access is at stake, <laughs> like clean water is at stake, like everything is at stake in this moment and we need everyone who is made it, motivated to act now. Um, also thank you for everyone who participated and asked questions. I know the chat, oh, fired up, ready to go right there, Jeff. Um, but you know, we know that there was some discussion and exchange and you know, the chat, just everyone, thank you for coming earnestly and as your best self. Now, if you are interested in running for office, even if you're not one of those people that said 2022, even if you're not one of those people that said 2023, if you were in that 53% of people who said, I am interested and I'm thinking about it, what I need you to do as soon as you hit leave on the Zoom call is go to www.runforwhat.org and just say, my hat's in the ring. Tell me what I need to do. Tell me where I need to get started. And our team will follow up with you to make sure you have all the tools you need to figure out what your story is, what your message is, how to get on the ballot, how to raise money. We are here to help you and we want to help you. Um, so make sure you do that. Everyone else who's here, we're definitely gonna follow up with everyone via email. Welcome to the Run for Something family. We are happy you are here. And now that you're here, we're never letting y'all leave. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, everyone. And y'all have a wonderful evening. Thanks, y'all.